Well, hey there team, welcome back to the channel and welcome to my review, or we'll probably call it an early access review, of Pioneers of Pagonia. For those that aren't across it, we're doing reviews these days. I'm a bit of a reluctant reviewer. I don't I don't like reviewers in general. I don't relate to them. It's, it's not anything personal. Uh, there's so many people that would rather write essays and they're more interested in the craft of writing and, and wordsmanship than actually just being what I'm doing, an idiot with a microphone from one gamer to another. And so that's the idea. Just uh, no dot points, no nothing. It's all off the cuff. The reason I mentioned early access, because it is in fact an early access game. One of the objective constraints that we've been doing, well, pretty much the only constraint uh, when I do these reviews is for every $5 that a game asks of me, I'll play it for an hour and I expect a good hour as well. And this, this allows me to sort of pseudo objectively rank games against each other. Problem with early access, and this is a good example, is um, it's not necessarily that it's bad, but it's definitely not final product. I'm not really interested in playing for a whole bunch of, what, like nine hours? This game is $45 Australian, and then maybe doing it again in a couple of years if it even makes it to full release. So the rule that we're gonna go with is I'm gonna play it for half the amount of time. And if it goes to 1.0, I'll play it for another half then and, and render a verdict again. So yeah, like I said, $45 Australian, it's nine hours. We'll halve it and call it 20, 20 bucks, four hours, if you're following my math. So I've been playing this game for four hours to get an idea of where it's at. And if it ever does make it to full release, then we'll play it for another five and, and re-review it. I suspect this review might be spicy, even though I'm not trying to be spicy. This game is very much a settler's game. And from what I can understand, one of the dudes in charge of this studio was one of the kind of brainchild types around the original creation of the original Settlers games. However, we've seen stuff like this happen before. Uh, I think of Phoenix Point, the guy who created the original XCOM and coming back and arguably Phoenix Point had its own issues because it went onto the Epic Store, but it didn't exactly blow everyone out of the water. I really like Phoenix Point and it is different from the modern XCOMs and it takes a lot from them and does its own thing. But I guess what I'm getting at is just because you've got the dude that created a great game from 20 or 30 years ago does not necessarily mean that this is going to be also great. The other aspect is, for whatever reason, and it will eternally escape me, it's very popular to hate the new Settlers, new Allies game that Ubisoft did. I think it was earlier this year, actually. I really enjoyed it. I played Settlers 2 back in the day, so I have a bit of nostalgia for it. But I'm not best particularly married to the series, and I'm not against evolving games that are 30 years old. But I just found it to be really quite solid. Um, and I got a lot of hate for that because it's not the settlers. So these are sort of little caveats that I would set this up with. This game feels a lot more like settlers too, actually. Much bigger scale, and it seems to have a lot of the trappings that the settlers new allies has. It almost feels like an early access version of that, albeit kind of on a larger scale. The size of the economy, the, there's going to be comparisons between the two because these are my reference points, my touch zones. The economy in New Allies is actually quite small, or at least it's very, very graspable. And it's all about pushing bottlenecks from uh, resource deposits up. So you don't have exhaustible resources, not really. You have infinite tree spots, you have infinite fishing spots, and you tap them and you essentially oversaturate them with workers because they will only generate so much per whatever minute. And that's where your real bottleneck is. And from there, you build your economy up. And personally, I really, really quite love that. It's it's less about trying to get 100% perfect ratios in something like you might see in Satisfactory or Factorio. Uh, and it's more about, as I said, oversaturating um, the bottom bottleneck, which is the resource source. This doesn't do this. This is much higher scale. But the problem is that a lot of the mechanics that are going on here seem to kind of creak under the weight of said scale. Like controlling your economy and understanding it at any given time, there is no real feedback. There's no like information or graphs or anything like that. Um, as far as say, queuing up tools to be built or dudes to be trained. 
It doesn't really have a, well, it doesn't have a float system. I don't know what else to call it, but it, something like where you would go, hey, keep 10 in storage at all times. And if it drops below 10, build another one. So it doesn't have that. And I think that's a must have, especially when you have a large economy with a lot of stuff in it and a lot of gatherers moving around. So the bigger it gets, the more important it gets to have higher fidelity control over massaging those bottlenecks. But it doesn't have that. What it does have is you can queue up one, two, three. You can do it in stacks of five. Uh, you can set it to infinite. But at the same time, if uh, if it's putting out like five different goods and you set them all to infinite, it doesn't have uh, an AI built in that's smart enough to figure out what's lowest in the stockpile so you can actually meet demand, right? So say you're producing shields and spears, just to make a basic example, all it's going to do is bounce back and forth between them. At least it doesn't At least it doesn't just do the front stack. So if you set infinity, it only did that. So if you go infinite shields and infinite spears, it's just going to go one, 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 bouncing back and forth. I'm using my hands. Bouncing back and forth between the two. The problem with that is if the shields aren't getting used, and I tested this because I wanted to know because this is how I look at economies in these games. If the shields are just sitting there in storage, not getting built, but you're building tons of spearmen or whatever, which is possible, different classes, different equipment, um, then uh, your shields are just going to stack up 10, 20, 30, and your spears are going to be sort of in short supply. So then you're going to have to get in there and go specific buildings. And again, this is only really a problem because this game seems to want to go for the hundreds and hundreds of villages scale. Uh, and I believe, you know, to be fair, as much as I do enjoy Settlers New Allies, that is fire and forget. You can just go do infinite and probably make separate buildings for separate build goods. But because the economy is so much smaller and the population is smaller, and it's all kind of about feeding into your army, which you then throw your army against their army and it gets deleted and, and then you backfill your army. But because of the scale level of that game, it's not really a big deal, but it's a problem here. To the point where you don't know where the bottlenecks are, if there are any bottlenecks. And here's the real, the, the thing that I'm really wondering about is, is this a limit because it's in early access and this stuff's going to get implemented later? Or is this a design philosophy? But yeah, so it's hard to put my finger on it, but it feels like there's some really big, broad design concepts missing. And I worry that after my four hours with it, that I can't really see them. Because at the other end of the scale, like the the actual, all the different buildings and the resources that they build, all that sort of stuff, all the little animations and the art, and even though it's got a, a bit more of an indie jank, it still has that beautiful uh, thing that I love so much about New Allies, where you see the individual dudes picking up and moving the individual items and, and crafting them and, and that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't have like the donkey cart economy, which I think is one of the strongest things of Settlers New Allies. It's really fun sort of upping your capacity to carry. In this, the answer is instead of uh, get, making a situation where your dude can pull a donkey and cart and carry 10 items, in this it's just use 10 more dudes. So those moving parts at the, the bottom end of the scale are working, which is good. You could argue they're fundamentals. But again, it's not really clear what the game really wants to be or wants you to do. There's some scenarios which are okay, but it's pretty clear that it wants you to just sandbox it and do some randomly generated maps. Um, and all it really boils down to is you find another team and then you deliver them the goods that they want, do the arbitrary missions that they want, or you push your territory out until you run into bandit camps and then you just wipe them out with your sort of standing army. So yeah, look, there's flashes of brilliance in here, but it feels like there's not a game either. That sounds really scathing. It's not meant to be, but it, it almost feels like it's got all the moving parts and tools, but it's missing the actual part where it turns into a game that challenges that you, that you engage with, be it from fighting with a massive army and trying to build a, a, a logistics chain or an economy to support that, or even just having a city builder kind of economy that's solid a la something like Anno. Neither of those things are really in there. So you can build the supply chains, you can build the dudes out, but to what end other than to just do it? And then before you know it, you've built one of everything or whatever, and 
you kind of done. One of the other things that really is jarring, and you'll see in my footage, I obviously like to build in cubes and I found a way to do it. <laughs> I like to build city blocks and what have you. But the way that the AI is behaving is that they have collision, essentially. It's their traffic, their cars, I came to realize. You have two lane roads and your dudes get bottlenecked because they're trying to go home to origin to the ship um, and even trying to unentangle this is quite difficult as well because if they cross each other, it become it actually becomes like city skylines except with none of the traffic management tools at your disposal. So if you build a, uh, like a, a crossroads in this, it's not like you have traffic lights, but you have all these dudes that just stand still for ages trying to give way to each other. And then if they're going into like stockpiles or storages, they really do start to bug out against each other and just jam up your entire economy. And this is exacerbated by the fact that it wants you to have like a couple hundred villages. So that becomes a real pain. Now, they do seem to have some sort of AI that governs, I, like I, I made roads around the traffic jam, <laughs> to call it, like that's what it is. And, you know, in some cases they would actually go around the long way because I guess the game's figured out it's going to take too long to sit there and wait. But it's like, if you're going to do this weird villager uh, traffic jam stuff, which is fine. Give me different types of roads. Give me multiple lane things like highways. Give me roundabouts or bloody traffic lights. So it was very, very strange that um, once you really start to build your village up, it really starts to fall over because, uh, you know, it, it seems to have intentionally or otherwise kind of really dumb traffic AI that doesn't walk through each other, which is very, very strange. So I'm not sure what they're going for there. Maybe I'm missing it, but it makes it kind of unpleasant when once you sort of built up your economy, the loop kind of just devolves into what? Trying to repath and tackle an AI that's behaving a bit strange and path accordingly. I don't know, man, a bit odd. So yeah, where would I put it on my list? Ugh, this is a bit of a tough one because again, it's not a finished product. It, they could turn around and turn it into a 1.0 absolute monster gem, but what's there at the moment? While it's not bad, it kind of is doing the cardinal sin that it's not really a game either. This might come across as savage, but I'm actually going to put this down at slot 16. So that should be under Death Roads and above the Kinderman. Again, I don't hate it. I don't dislike it. I feel like I can see there's some interesting moving parts there. But if you're going to go and drop 45 bucks on a game and, and hope that it's actually a game, I think you might be disappointed. If you want to do it because you just want to support the direction and back this sort of thing, that's fine. But as far as like a functional, ready to go game that's going to engage you for more than a couple of hours, it's not there yet. Which in turn raises another question. Obviously, we talk often about early access and it being a vector for scamming and, and uh, half-baked work. This obviously has had a lot of work go into it, but I feel like maybe they've just focused on the wrong area and they should have worried more about if we're going to ask for money, no matter how polished and cool and interesting a lot of the animations and the fundamental moving parts are, is our game actually fun? Is it worth asking for this money to play our game? Play being the operative. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. Thanks again for joining me, team. I might just leave it there for the time being. I'll catch you guys on the next one.